Hello and welcome to this episode of Night Sky News for August 2022 with me, astrophysicist Dr. Becky Smethurst. This is the show where we chat about what you can look out for in the night sky in the next few weeks and we chat about what's been happening in space news in the past few weeks. Any scientific research papers I mentioned will all be linked in the video description down below and there's chapter titles down here if you want to skip ahead to any specific news story because real quick just before we dive in I want to remind you that my new book A Brief History of Black Holes is out next week on Thursday the 1st of September 2022. This is a book I've written for anyone of any ability to understand and it goes through what we know about black holes by looking at the history of our understanding and the the human stories behind all the different breakthroughs through the past century to help you understand the physics behind black holes better. It's fun and engaging and full of pop culture references as well. So if you want to get one, the link to pre-order it or to buy it if it's past the 1st of September is in the video description down below, or you can get one from your local bookshop. And yes, there is an audiobook, and yes, I did narrate it myself. I'm going to be doing a YouTube live stream with like an Ask Me Anything Q&A to celebrate the release next week. So look out for that. But if you can't wait that long, then you could also, you know, just an entire week, you could also check out Antonio Padilla's book, Fantastic Numbers and Where to Find Them. Again, it's a public science book. It sort of looks at the maths behind what we know about the universe. I'm reading it at the minute and I am absolutely loving it. So check that out if you fancy it. But without any further ado, let's kick off this episode of Night Sky News and start by looking up. All right, here in the Northern Hemisphere, as we look towards September, we're starting to get longer and darker nights. Now, it's kind of the perfect time to stargaze because it's still slightly warm and some of the sights of summer are still up and visible. So the summer triangle of some of the three brightest stars in the summer sky of Deneb, Vega and Altair is visible all evening and until the early morning hours as well. And it really frames the Milky Way nicely as well. So the center of the Milky Way where, you know, it's densest, where there's the most stars is in the constellation of Sagittarius. People look out for this little teapot shape. That's a little bit low on the horizon now for those of us in Northern Europe, but you can still see that very dense part that runs up towards the constellation of Cygnus, the very top of the summer triangle. So catch that dense bit of the Milky Way now, because even by late September, that's going to have sank lower in the sky. It's going to be in that haze on the horizon, making it very difficult to see. Obviously, the further south you are, the longer this is going to stay in the sky for, but you know, everything I've just said still kind of applies to the southern hemisphere too, right? You've got your longer winter nights at the minute, very, very dark skies, where you can try and catch that very center of the Milky Way in the constellation of Sagittarius while it's still high in the sky before midnight. Wherever you are in the world though, while you're out there looking for the Milky Way, look for Jupiter and Saturn rising in the east in the early evenings throughout August and September. Saturn will be visible first with its sort of yellowish color. It's ever so slightly fainter than Jupiter below it, which will be the brightest thing in the sky, so hopefully you can't miss it. A quick tip for picking out which are the planets, though, from the stars. Planets don't twinkle because they are much closer to us. They appear much larger on the sky. You're getting light from a much larger area, and so even if a little bit of that light is disturbed by the atmosphere as it comes towards us, the object still looks fairly solid, whereas with a star, it's just a pinprick of light, so any disruption in the atmosphere, it takes away a little bit of that light, and you get that sort of twinkling variation for stars. So look for those objects that look like they've got much more of a solid, consistent light those will be the planets. Plus, Mars joins the party too in September, rising behind Jupiter. If you look out for it in early September after midnight, it'll actually be in the constellation of Taurus, right by the red star Aldebaran. And I think that'd be a really nice pairing of those two red objects on the sky. Then there's another planet to look out for in the skies at the minute too, because on the 27th of August, Mercury reaches what's known as its greatest elongation, which is when it's furthest away from the sun on the sky from our perspective here on Earth anyway, which means it will be higher above the horizon after sunset and stay longer in the sky before it sets. It's still very low on the horizon though, only about 20 degrees or so above the horizon. So for context, if you make a fist and hold it at arm's length, that's about 10 degrees. So it's only so far above the horizon. So it's going to be really low down. So for us up here, again, in the Northern Hemisphere, where we have 
very long days and very long sunsets at the minute where the sun is setting at a very steep angle to the horizon, we're probably not going to be able to catch Mercury. So essentially, the further south you are, the better chance you have of actually spotting this because it's going to be higher above the horizon. If it helps though, on the evening of Monday the 29th and Tuesday the 30th of August, there'll also be a very thin crescent moon or toenail moon, as I like to call it. <laughs> just very nearby to Mercury. So that should make picking out Mercury in the bright glow of sunset just that little bit easier. Then from the closest planet to the sun to the most distant planet from the sun, because on the 16th of September, Neptune reaches what we call opposition, with the sun, Earth and Neptune all in one line. It's the closest Neptune gets to Earth as they both go about their orbits. And it means it's also perfectly lit by the sun as well. So it's also the brightest it gets on the sky. On the 16th, it'll not be too far away from Jupiter, but unfortunately you can't pick this out with just your eyes alone. It's just too far away. But if you have binoculars that you can hold steady on a tripod or a telescope, then you're gonna have a really good chance of being able to spot Neptune. Or, you know, you could even just grab your phone and try a long exposure, like night mode shot to see if you can pick it out. I've made a video before with beginners astrophotography tips with your phone and your camera as well if you've never tried to take photos of the sky before, so check that out. I'll link it in the video description down below. All right, that's enough of looking up at the night sky. Let's come back down to Earth now and chat about what's been happening in space news in the past month. <laughs> All right, let's start with the big news this month, the imminent launch of the Artemis 1 mission, which will be the first flight for NASA's new space launch system in the Orion spacecraft, which is planned for Monday the 29th of August. It rolled out of the vehicle assembly building on the 17th of August and everyone was just hooked to the live stream watching it. If you've not heard of the Artemis missions yet, it's NASA and ESA's joint program to send humans back to the moon. Now, Artemis 1 will be uncrewed. It's a maiden test flight that'll last around a month or so. It's going to loop around the moon before heading back to Earth and splashing down in the Pacific Ocean. Obviously, if all of that goes well, then it does open the door to an actual crewed mission, which will be Artemis 2, which is planned for launch in May 2024, which again will just be a, a loop around the moon. And then finally, Artemis 3, planned for late 2024, where a crew will finally land on the moon. And it'll be the first people on the moon since Apollo 17 in 1972. But with this crew, they aim to put the first woman on the moon and also the first non-white person on the moon as well. So yeah, it's a really exciting prospect that we could be sending humans back to the moon. I haven't actually talked much about this mission on my channel before. First of all, because I'm not an expert in this stuff, right? Like I do science. I explain objects in space. I don't send stuff to space. <laughs> so if you want to hear from more sort of experts on these topics, I obviously definitely recommend the YouTube channel from Scott Manley, who focuses more on space flight and spacecraft. Or oh, I think the best person to follow for this kind of stuff is Joan Marie, either on Instagram as Your Female Engineer or on Twitter as Your Female Eng. She actually works at NASA as an engineer developing the Space Launch System, SLS. And of course, Camille Calabio, who is the galactic gal on both Instagram and on TikTok as well. She's an engineer that worked on the Orion spacecraft that will take astronauts to the moon as part of the Artemis program. So again, definitely someone you want to follow if you want updates on this. And now the other reason that I've not really mentioned this on my channel that much is, it's probably a little bit of a controversial one to be honest, but I'm not actually that excited about it. I mean, you guys know me, like I get excited about the tiniest of blips in stars, atmospheres, but... With this, I just kind of feel like it's not quite worth the money and people's time to do this, right? I mean, to me, there's no political argument that you could make to justify sending, you know, people back to the moon. There has to be a valid scientific reason that we should go back to the moon and build a lunar base, like it's sort of the long-term goals of the Artemis mission. But I think in terms of all of the science goals of the Artemis mission, you could easily achieve those with just probes and robots that would be less money and way less risk. Like, I don't sit on the funding councils that make the decisions of like where to put the funding, but I just feel like I probably would have voted to split that money across 
many different scientific projects and missions that we could have learned way more from, and then probably also some projects and problems here on Earth that also need funding. I mean, on the one hand, like, I would love to see women and people of colour on the moon. Like, just think how much that would mean to so many people around the world, kids and adults, in terms of seeing themselves represented in those astronauts, you know, just the empowerment and the inspiration from that's going to be incredible. But do I want that at the expense of a load of other scientific projects that could have gone ahead that, you know, could have created jobs for more women and more people of colour in STEM fields as well? Like, I, I don't know, like, I'm really torn about it. Although I do know that the Greek mythology nerd in me is just absolutely relieved that they called this mission the Artemis mission after the actual goddess of the moon and not Apollo, who was the god of the sun in Greek mythology. As I said, it's probably a very controversial opinion and probably a lot of my colleagues would disagree with me as well, but I'd love to know what you think, so let me know down in the comments below. All right, on to what is slowly becoming, I think, everyone's favourite part of Night Sky News, your monthly James Webb Space Telescope update, or JWST as we call it. So we saw the release of another beautifully processed and coloured image from NASA this month of the Cartwheel Galaxy. I made a whole video about this image and what it can teach us. Again, I'll link that down below if you want to check it out. And I've seen a lot of chat online with people like, oh, we got five images on the 12th of July, and then we had to wait a whole month until we got another one. No, there are new images coming down from JWST every single day, but they're in their raw format and are posted on sort of the archive that hosts all of these images rather than being processed and coloured by NASA for like a public release. Instead, they're made public on the MAST website, this archive that I just mentioned, which I'll link down below if you want to have a go at grabbing some of the JWST data yourself. I was very excited, for example, to see that Messier 16, or the Eagle Nebula, has been observed this week with the NearCam detector. The famous Hubble Space Telescope image of the Pillars of Creation is part of the Eagle Nebula, and personally I had my money on this being one of the first science images released by JWST, but I was wrong. <laughs> Unfortunately, though, the data for that is not yet public. The team who applied for that data have got a six months proprietary period to actually look at it. So we'll either have to wait to hear from the team themselves or wait until these images get made public in February 2023 and download them and have a play around with them ourselves. I bet the team are quite glad though that they've got some of that proprietary period because I think one thing that people didn't expect when JWST was first conceived of, even five, ten years ago, was the fact that a lot of the public data that the science teams who developed all of these instruments that are taking these images and are getting their hands on first but it's still being made public and now in competition with like amateur astronomers as well who are just you know posting things on reddit as soon as they've got these image processed themselves. I had a chat with Dr Libby Jones from the Miri science team about this as well and also all of like the backstage stories from that commissioning period of JWST as well just to get like the inside scoop. So that video is going to be coming out very soon on my channel so make sure you subscribe so you don't miss it. Then while we're on the topic of JWST I just want to talk about this article that went sort of like semi-viral last week that a lot of you sent to me like, is this true? Has JWST data shown the Big Bang never happened? No, it hasn't. And there is so much to unpack here. <laughs> First of all, we've got to remember that the Big Bang is not some moment of creation that time equals zero, right? Instead, what the Big Bang theory is, is it describes how the universe went from a very hot, dense state 13.8 billion years ago by expanding and describes, you know, how the distribution and the density of matter and radiation through all that time has led to the distribution of galaxies that we see today and the shapes of galaxies that we see today. Essentially, it describes how the universe has evolved. So to say the Big Bang never happened is like saying the universe never evolved or the universe didn't expand, which of course it did. We have so much evidence for that. We have the fact that, you know, galaxies at greater distance have a greater redshift, right? Because they're moving away from us faster. We can see that galaxies in the early universe look very different to what they look like today because we can actually see what the early universe looked like because light takes time to get to us. This is the evidence that the Big Bang Theory as a whole is built upon. Is it a perfect theory? 
No, because no theory ever is. They're always subject to change as new bits of evidence come in and our understanding gets better. The second thing to unpack here is everything that's said in this article is also utter and complete tosh, what they say in it as well, to push their own narrative, which has led to a lot of confusion amongst, you know, the public as well, because it's just really bad science communication at the end of the day. For example, he claims that all us astrophysicists are now panicking because of all of the images and data that JWST is sending down that don't make sense. And he points at one specific paper that's been published that starts with the word panic with an exclamation mark. I know this paper is written by my colleagues at Oxford, Nathan and Aprajita, and the title is actually a panic at the disco pun. I chimed in with a habit you people ever heard of. Doing the goddamn science. I mean, it's absolutely laughable the things that are like cherry picking to try and fit this narrative. Like they took a quote from my colleague, Alison Kirkpatrick from a Nature article way out of context. And as you can imagine, as anyone would be, she was absolutely furious about this, especially with the inundation of emails from you know, other colleagues as well, being like, why on earth were you quoted in this article? Tell them the fact that she's now changed her Twitter name to Alison the Big Bang Happened Kirkpatrick, which is just... Now, if you were going to read anything on this topic, it would be that Nature article. I think it gives a pretty good summary of where we're at now, a few weeks into getting JWST data. Remembering that good, careful science takes time. So what we actually do now have evidence for is that we're seeing disk galaxies, these flat galaxies that are very ordered systems where all the stars are going round uh, in the same plane, kind of like the solar system. We're seeing those galaxies a lot earlier in the universe's history than we've ever seen before. And that's what this panic at the disco bun paper was talking about. That was an unexpected result. And also this result that shows that they're smaller than expected as well, based on what we've seen before, like reported in this paper by Ren Suis and collaborators. And I think the key phrase there is that this was unexpected based on what we've seen before. All of our models and hypotheses and theories are all based on the observations we previously had, like for example, from the Hubble Space Telescope, which, you know, this data is limited in what we can see in it. You know, galaxies at great distances just look like blobs to the Hubble Space Telescope, right? They're not resolved, so they look puffed up, so they appear larger than they actually are, plus at these great distances, we can't resolve any features anymore, like spiral arms or bars or anything like that. So for example, when we've looked at this previously, like Brooke Simmons and I did with the Galaxy Zoo team back in 2014, we see that the number of like featured disk galaxies that we can pick out drop off with distance. And we didn't know if that drop off was actually a true drop off in the number of featured disk galaxies in the universe or whether it was what we call an observational bias, i.e. we were limited to what we would see with telescopes because we just couldn't see features beyond that distance. Whereas now with JWST, we're finally actually seeing all of those disk galaxies at these great distances. So the little circles here are old uh, Hubble Space Telescope observations, and then the X's circle with a really big circle are the new JWST observations. And you can see there's way more disks at these higher redshifts. Now, obviously our previous models for how galaxies evolve, you know, from the early universe to today, which obviously fits into the overall Big Bang theory of how the universe evolved, these theories were based on our previous observations, those we had from the likes of the Hubble Space Telescope. You know, essentially we needed the universe to have calmed down and expanded enough in order to have one of these sort of stable, isolated disk galaxies to have formed around about two to three billion years into the universe's lifetime. Whereas now we're finding a large fraction of disk galaxies with JWST at a time when the universe was only 1.5 billion years old. So yes, our models are gonna need some tweaking in order for us to get disk galaxies forming much earlier in the universe. Maybe there's some process that we haven't considered yet. But with this, we're gonna have a much better idea about how galaxies evolve and what shape they are and what size they are, which is awesome that we're gonna get that from this data. So does that mean that the Big Bang never happened? No, no it does not. Does that mean that we're all panicking? No, no it does not. In fact, it's probably the opposite. We're all really excited for what this new data is gonna teach us so that we can make our theories better. So don't believe everything you read on the internet, folks. Make sure it's from a trusted source. 
And one more piece of Genoa Tea News before we chat about Beetlejuice, because the Sears survey, which is one of the early release science programs on JUST that aims to do a really deep field image of a really large patch of sky, has released the first of their processed data, which covers an area about eight times larger than the SMACS image released with those first science images back in July. It's actually the largest deep field galaxy image ever taken and you can download it in really high resolution online as well if you want to have a little look through it yourself. And this is just the first data they've collected. You can see how they're sort of slowly filling in all the gaps on this patch of sky with the rest of the data set to be taken in December. Once again, there's so much in this image to see and so many galaxies and cool things that you can find in the background and be like, ooh, what's that, what's that? The Sears team actually picked out some of their favorites that they spotted. For example, this pair of interacting spiral galaxies that includes the discovery of a supernova in this image as well and another candidate for the most distant galaxy ever found, the light from which left that galaxy when the universe was only about 400 million years old. Again, that's just a candidate for one of the most distant galaxies we know. I talked about this in last month's Night Sky News. They can only grab this from the image based on its color and size. They actually need a spectrum where you take the light and split it through a prism in order to its component wavelengths to actually pinpoint how much the light has been redshift and therefore what distance it's at. And that's obviously going to take time, first of all, for JWST to get the spectrum and also for that spectrum to be analyzed as well. So this release of the image is essentially the first step on the path to science, right? They've done all the hard work of processing the image, removing sort of any sources of noise, either from the telescope telescope itself or from like cosmic rays, stuff like that. And now they've got this sort of science ready image. They can go away and, you know, ask questions about, hey, what's this? What's that showing? Or what's the distribution of matter in this image as well? And what do these galaxies look like at various different distances, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm really excited to see what my colleagues find in this first set of images and data from the Sears survey. And when they do publish those results in a new scientific paper, you can be sure that I'll report back right here on this channel. And finally, let's talk about the star Betelgeuse. This is a star that's in the corner of the Orion constellation that looks kind of reddish on the sky because it is a red supergiant star. It's actually the largest star that you can see with the naked eye in the sky. And when I say large, I mean large. If it was at the center of the solar system, its surface would be somewhere between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter beyond the asteroid belt. And it is so big because it is nearing the end of its life and it is trying to delay the inevitable. It's running out of fuel and it's very close to going supernova anywhere, you know, from tomorrow to 100,000 years time. Now, cast your mind back to about autumn 2019, you know, in those blissful pre-pandemic times when Betelgeuse started to drop in brightness. It dimmed massively. You know, in the middle of the year in 2019, Betelgeuse was like the sixth brightest star in the night sky. But by the end of December 2019, it was only the 21st brightest star in the sky. It bottomed out in around February 2020 before it started to get brighter again. And people did start to wonder if it was about to go supernova, but I covered how that probably wasn't the case in my night sky news video way back from January 2020. And the most favored explanation for this dimming at the time was that it was due to dust, essentially, you know, like larger atoms and molecules things like carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen that came, you know, from inside Betelgeuse itself, probably, that were blocking a load of that light. And that made sense looking at sort of like the before and after shots of Betelgeuse too, because it seemed to have this really dodgy shape as well after this dimming. And now this month, a new paper has been published by Andrea Dupree and collaborators explaining where this excess of dust suddenly came from, a surface mass ejection or SME. This is similar to the coronal mass ejections that we see from the sun, where you get these sort of big loops of charged particles, aka like plasma, right? burped up into space, which when they reach Earth, cause auroras, like the northern and the southern lights. With a surface mass ejection though, we're talking about a huge amount of material literally ejected from the surface of the star. When I say a huge amount, I really do mean it. We're talking hundreds of billions of times the amount of matter that's given out 
in a coronal mass ejection is given out in a surface mass ejection. It's this that's thought to have dredged up that dust and caused the severe dimming of Betelgeuse. A hypothesis that fits all the observations of the brightness of Betelgeuse and the spectrum taken of Betelgeuse before, during and after this dimming episode. And what's more is that Dupree and collaborators pointed out that this could be cyclical and happen again in early 2026. But until then, I think we should all keep our eyes peeled so that we don't miss anything. You know, every time you go outside, look at the night sky, make sure you just have a little glance up at Beetlejuice. <laughs> Check it's still there. <laughs> All right, that's it for Night Sky News for this month. As a reminder, if you're interested in the history of our understanding of black holes and what we know now, the link to pre-order my new book, A Brief History of Black Holes, is in the video description down below. I cannot believe that it's out next week already. And just a friendly reminder that pre-orders are hugely important to authors because they contribute to a book's first week of sales. As always, if you snap any pictures of the night sky, or even if you snap some pictures of yourself wearing some of my new merch, send them my way over on social media because I'd always love to see them. But until next time, everybody, happy stargazing every single day but they're in their raw format ra format their raw format <laughs> not even a word <laughs> there is a motorbike outside again how i hate those motorbikes should have been a country singer team on these first images as well and you can bet when those are published i'll be reporting them on reporting them on this reporting on them on this channel on them on this channel there so close. It's also complete and utter tosh as well, so they can push their own narrative. Oh, motorbike, bugger off, will you? I'm trying to think if tosh is a word that people outside the UK will understand. I don't know. Maybe it's a Britishism. Britishism? Oh, is that even a word? Oh, I don't know. Oh, should I look it up and find out? How oh, do I not care that much? Tosh. Informal British. Rubbish. Nonsense. I just really like the word. You know what? I'm just going to say it. I might put the definition on the screen below as well, just in case anyone else is like me and thinks that space is hard, but words are harder. <laughs> Somebody had told me that thighs of thunder are normal human thighs. The freaking pressure Beetlejuice was under to go supernova tonight.